12 percent. Let me show you. The market interest rate is 12 percent. In real life, okay, in real life, it is much more complicated. We're just assuming your company enter into with the vendor fixed rate at 12 percent. In real life, when the period longer, vendor, they don't want to go to the fixed rate. They want to go with adjustable rate because market change all the time, okay? We just assume for these two years, the market does not change too much. So, you know, you and your vendor both agree upon 12%. Uh, it's very high, by the way, okay? All right, so this is a 12% rate, all right? So we refer to the uh, present value table. So 200,000 cash pay in two years the present value convert to today, we use this factor, okay? Uh, so, please. So for the value of the truck, it is not 200,000 for today. On the day you pick up the truck, the value you enter into under the assets, debit, okay? That is 159,440. Anybody got confused here? We we'll, we'll pause for a while. We do not enter into the value as 20,000 on the day we pick up the truck. Instead of the true value of the truck is 159,440. And this is num the number we enter into, okay, um, assets. Everybody, you don't understand? You feel confused? So this is based on the zero interest. No, okay, don't get misled. There's no such thing as zero interest, okay? Even though your vendor say this is a zero interest, that's for wrong, by the way. Okay, you cannot you cannot enter two hundred thousand into your into your assets because this is one very important factor here. The market rate is a uh, twelve percent. Market rate. Somebody gonna pay. Somebody gonna pay for it. Somebody gonna pay for it. If not you, then somebody else. Definitely is not vendor, right? They will not make any sales. You know, losing losing money by losing money. So. Don't be fooled by zero interest. And the, you know, here we've been told 12%. 12% is 12%. So we need to base on 12% to calculate what is the present value for the day. It's of the day. All right? So on the day we receive the truck, we enter into this tier account. See? We don't enter 200,000. We only enter into 159,440 as assets. And all account note payable, same number. We do not enter into 200. All right. So don't be fooled by don't be fooled by zero. There's no such zero interest. We convert it. All right. So we don't use 200. We use a 159 instead of. Then, okay. By the end of uh, each year, even though there's no cash payment, even though by the end of the first year, there is no payment because according to our agreement, this you don't have to. You don't have to. We don't pay anything until the end of the second year. So even without, even without the cash payment, we need to do the adjustment. We need to do something <coughs> to reflect. Okay? When we say transaction, not necessarily mean payment. Okay? There is no payment, but there is transaction, okay, on the last day of uh, the first year. So we calculate what is the interest we should pay, but we have not yet. That is this amount, 159, okay. This is the 159 here, 159, 440 times 12%. So interest 
or something payable, uh, node payable is 19133. Uh, in our book, we we use the same account, okay, node payable 19133. And we incur expenses without any cash payment. We can report expenses, which is good for your business. Because this report will reduce your net profit for the year, even though you have not paid cash yet. This is a good one. Anybody got confused here? Then we can move on. Eventually, uh, you can use interest payable, I don't care. In the book, it's a note payable. I, it's, it's fine, because you just want to match, okay? But since uh, your note payable at the beginning is only 159440, I would rather use an interest payable and to match interest expenses. Nothing wrong. So far, so good, right? Then for the next year, you pay out 20,000. Before I show you the slide, what you will do? On the last day you paid 20,000. You have the cash, right? Credit by 20,000, no problem, right? So how can you match totally 20,000 on your debit side. Think about this. You need to almost repeat. You almost <coughs> need to repeat the step that like first year. You have a 159440 times another 12%. So oh, by the way, not only that, you need to have a 159440 plus one nine something because you did not pay for it, right? So your interest become the principal. You see? This is a compound, right? So your principal increase is not 159,440 anymore. You have a bigger. So a bigger number times 12%. So we see why I'm here. I skip that page. <laughs> Maybe I'm focusing. Yeah, if you have a book based on your book, um, you have your group with you? Okay, look at your page uh, 4A. It's on your page 4A. Can anybody tell me what's the, uh, the, the payable on the second year? So this step by step, okay. Uh, we have uh, 159440 plus how much? Uh, 191. What's the payable for the first year? 191. 191333. So all together is. Uh, so this is the principle for the second year, right? Everybody. So 178533. This is the, the, the new, the update principle for the second year. So Marano. Am I right for this number? Did you see the same number on your page 480? Should be, should be on your page 480. So am I right with this number? This is update. This is update amount of the uh, principal for the second year. And we use this number to calculate what's the pay payable for the next year. So what's this number? For the second year, how much for the interest? <coughs> Two one two one two nine. Two one. Four two nine. Oh two nine. Four two nine. Four two nine. Four two nine. Okay, this is uh for the second year. This is for the second year. So you just repeat this. You have a uh, interest payable or note payable whatsoever. You report is you know this one as the uh, expenses, and all together you have this number plus this number plus this number. This very close to two hundred thousand. So you report it, okay? You pay off 20,000 cash and cover 159,440 as the, the original truck value plus two years each year interest. So you have everything 
finish. Of course, we we did not in the real life as accounting people, you are busier than this because for each year, don't forget, you need to do depreciation. <coughs> you see that, right? So this is a very funny uh, issue. Okay, think about this. Think about this. Let me ask you. Okay, can you do depreciation? Even though you still on payment, the issue. This is a big. This is a good topic for you to do your final presentation. The topic is: Can a vendor or business owner report depreciation even though you still on payment? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Even though you still on payment, you still can do depreciation. However, however, this is a problem. Here's the problem. IRS will say no. Why? Because you report double expenses. You, you see the points? If you pay all by cash, right, and you report depreciation, there's no problem because it only report one time, right? However, for this situation, you report interest expenses already one time and you report depreciation another time do you really mean we report on the same item twice that create a problem they create they, the IRS come in and say no 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 you can choose one way or the other otherwise you only use one truck then you report twice right but the answer is yes you still can report depreciation however within the limit within the limit. This is very complicated, so you really want to go for it, do it. If you think this is beyond your, your, your time, uh, your valuable time, you, you skip that. But I just give you the hint, okay? You can report expenses and depreciation in the same time, but within the limit, okay? So yes, that is true. Uh, we just convert this example as, as building, as office. That makes sense, right? Almost almost the majority of the investor on the market they purchased uh, the apartment for rent in the meantime they report interest expenses because they have mortgage also in the same time they report as depreciation it's allowable it's permittable so the answer is yes but how about i expand this example more one step more it may make you feel uneasy I change the scenario. If the whole thing I change a little bit, but on the format still the same. On the format still the same. If I change this scenario, you don't buy it. You unlease. Unlease, totally unlease. Can you report depreciation? The answer become more and more blurred and toward to no. If something you lease on, usually general rule is you cannot report depreciation. But exceptionally, you can. So upside down, upside down. So I think this issue is, uh, is beyond our, 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 our topic. But again, this is a very good topic for your final presentation. If you, if you really want to spend your time to learn something, not just give me the report. If you really want, if you really want to learn that, because this is good for business, by the way. Somehow down the road, you may encounter the same situation. You lease something, and you want to, by the way, lease by yourself. The everything you pay is expenses, right? Everything you pay out on lease, one percent is expenses. So on the top of lease, can you do more? One step more, you want to report depreciation. General rule is no, you cannot. But exception, you can do it. But that is not my problem. Oh, you need to check your, your <laughs> you need to, it's very complicated. So you need to check the, 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 the revenue code. So. Oh, another one I want to skip very quick is this one, annuity. Because more likely than, than the first one, the first one is very, very unusual, okay? You, you receive something and you don't pay. It's very, very uh, attractive, right? But not really frequent. More frequently, it's like this. You pay down the road. 
you play something down the road, that is more like an instrument. This is more popular way, okay? So that is um, your page. Uh, oh, by the way, this is a way I have here. So next one is immunity, uh, uh, okay. So I do have a page for you. This is example number two. On a certain day, your company purchased uh, equipment, all right? And you enter into the agreement. Instead of paying one time by the end, you pay same amount each period. This is called very typical instrument, especially fixed rate. Okay, the rate fixed. So apply to like a mortgage, same thing like this, right? For our personal, you purchase your residence. Same thing, same format. So in this case, your company pay certain amount of money, 163.686. Here, it change a little bit, okay? The rate is 11, 11% per year. So again, every year, but, oh, by the way, in our real life, making more complicated. Here, we only give you the example, your payment once a year. In real life, you know this is once a month. You need to do it every month, and also you need to adjust it, okay? Because uh, on our table, that's assuming the payment once a year, but in real life, is once a month. You need to divide by 12. You need to do it, adjust, to, to, to do the uh, adjustment. All right, everybody, follow me so far, right? You enter into with your vendor, you receive, you purchase the equipment, and you pay out one fixed amount payment every year by the end of each year. So here, on the day you receive the equipment, you need to do something. You need to do something, okay? This is the way to do it. You have this payment, 163, 686 convert to the present value as of the day you receive the equipment. It is not 163 times 4. It is not the number. You use the factor 2.44 instead of number 4. Okay? The reason why is we check the table. Appendix A-2, and we have 11% uh, interest rate, and I'm sorry, f three payment instead of four, okay? Three, okay? I thought it was four years, no, it's three years, okay? So, we, even though we pay three times, we pay three times, exactly the same amount. However, the factor here is only 2.44. That is how much the present value, the present value of three times 168,000. Okay, Maria? How did you get the 2.4 with that 11%? We'll hold it up. We'll hold it up. I just want to make sure I receive, I, I got the right number. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> if I got the wrong number, I will give it more confusion. And then I will, I will go back to Maria. Okay, how do we get this number? How, how do we get okay, 2.4 for how? It's a very complicated formula, by the way. Okay, <laughs> I will not go into that, but this is a formula here. You don't here. have to answer that. Yeah, I'll give it to you. Okay. <laughs> Even though I'm not the expert, and I don't want to waste time. But here it is, okay. It's very complicated. <coughs> this is uh, the, the formula. You use either Excel, or your, you use financial calculator. This is the formula here. But if you cannot see what it is, then forget it. Yeah, present value, we, we can actually plug yeah. those numbers and then we'll give us the answer. <coughs> you put this formula into your Excel. Then this uh, preset formula 
in your Excel. Okay, you just pick the present value of annuity, and they will enter into the interest rate eleven percent and three payment. You come on this number. All right. So we have a one sixty three thousand times two point four four, almost very close to the present value four hundred thousand. <coughs> Even though we know, actually, our total payment will exceed 400000 for sure, right? Because portion of our payment go to interest. So there's no such thing, zero interest, no such thing. We pay something to cover the time of value, that's called interest. Alright? So on the day we receive the truck or equipment, we enter into SS, Debbie 400, we have liability 400. So don't forget, don't forget, okay, hold, 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 hold. don't forget, our total payment will exceed 400. And the, the portion exceeds than 400, that is called interest expenses. Nothing wrong. Yes, go ahead, Marina. So when you buy a car or truck, and they said it's so interesting, you pay 20, 40,000 dollars, and they said here's all you have to pay. So they, they already do the interest? That's correct. That's correct. They even, they, even they told you zero interest, don't be fooled. Yeah, you will pay 40000 or whatever yeah. they say. Like yeah, but, the your, the value, but, the, but the value, the, the item you purchase is not 40000 Okay, it's You got it, right? Yeah. Even though you pay 40000 but in your mind, you know, there's no such thing, zero interest, you know. So the, the thing you receive is not really 40000 so, so you use the, the formula to, to convert the 40,000 to what really the true present value is. So you got a point, right? The thing you yes. receive is not 40,000. The, the thing you receive probably only 32. Okay, so, so you mm -hmm. have to use the percentage that they use yes. when they recognize Yes, you use it. this table. Oh. You use this table. Of course, you know, on today's market, interest rate is kind of low. When the interest is very low, then the payment you pay will be very, very close to the real value you got. You see the point, right? When the interest rate higher, you pay more. Okay? When interest rate is so low, the money you pay is almost the, the, the item you receive, the value, the true value. All right? So check this. So far so good, everything. So far so good. So, so based on this idea, we go further. We go further, okay? So on the day we enter into the equipment, 400,000 debit, and the, the note, uh, let me see, uh, note payable, okay, is uh, 400,000, so no problem. But on the day we really pay the first payment, we need to calculate, okay, because even though we pay 163, because this is the agreement, we have to do it, right? But we need to divide it, okay, for the, uh, so we have a 400,000 times 11%. So we know, we know for the first year, interest rate, the interest expense is 44. So we have a 163, this amount is a fixed. This amount is fixed. But these two numbers change every year. So the idea is so simple, right? You pay the same amount every year, but divided by two portions. One is the principal, one is the interest. In the beginning year, you pay more on interest. And this ratio revert. This percentage you revert. Even though you pay the same amount, okay? So the first year, we pay the same amount. However, we apply only 119 to the principal and we have 44,000 as interest. Again, the interest expenses you report. And don't forget, here we skip depreciation. But in real life, you need to do your depreciation based on your 400,000 value. You need to do some kind of depreciation. So you have two different type expenses. Okay, one is interest expenses, the other one is depreciation. And you need to check what's the name. I think in this scenario, my, my knowledge is there's not too much limitation there because you are under the title already. 
you are the you are legally to report twice. One portion report as the interest expenses, the other portion you report as a depreciation. So you have a double benefit. All right. As a, as a, um, in order to re reduce your uh, income tax liability, you would like to report higher, more your expenses. Of course, legal. Right. This is the first year. No problem, right? So far, so good. Okay, for the second year, you just almost repeat that, but this time, we change that a little bit. You pay the same amount, however, Okay, page 481. On the second year, you pay the same amount here, 163. However, those two numbers change. Why? Because you have a 400 original note payable. You deduct 119 already because you pay off this amount in the first year. And your interest reduced to only 30. So even though you pay the same total amount, however, you apply more toward to your principal. Not necessarily good because your expenses reduce. Even though you pay the same amount of cash, however, your expenses reduce, you can only <coughs> deduct less expenses. So not necessarily very good. This is another reason why, let me tell you, okay, why people want to get a refinance on their house. It is not here, but for your real life, there's another reason why people would like to get a refinance. Is it get it lower or maybe not really just thing? lower, because of by the, if you pay more, then the amount you can deduct from your income become less and less. So you need to get a refinance and revert, reset everything back to the 30 years. Understand? So if you are the person pay off your loan toward to the later period, say, the the, the, the year 25, 26, 27, even though you pay the same amount, but less amount you can deduct from your income purposes. So this is another reason. Same thing happened to the business. Okay? Of course, you know, for the equipment, then usually you cannot, very hard for you to get a refinance. The reason why is the value decreases every year. Right? But for the house, the, the value eventually goes out every year. So, you know, if we apply this, the same concept on your, on your residence, that's another reason why. If you, uh, you, if you see the interest rate go down, go lower, makes sense to get revenue. Uh, number one, you get a lower monthly payment. Number two, you get more amount applied to do the, uh, the tax deduction. Yes, go ahead. Yes, sir. You, you can also do that with uh, refinancing the car loan, right? I mean, we're doing, talking about yeah, uh, years. Yes, yes, but the problem is for the car loan, unless you use your car for business. Otherwise, you cannot deduct. You see the difference? There is the tax code allow people to deduct your mortgage interest from your home as an itemized deduction on your tax return. However, there's no such code allow people to deduct your car from your personal use. So, not too much sense. Unless, as I said, you use your car as a business, otherwise you won't consider it. Go ahead, Jeff. So, uh, so uh, when doing a refinance, so it, in a sense, is it like uh, leasing the house? You set it back every three years, you set it back every three years too? Uh, but again, same problem, unless you use your car as a business. Uh -huh. Yeah, you use a car as a business, you can consider it. But you still cannot apply the same same concept because the value of the car going down every year. So it's very tough to get a refinance on your automobile. I don't know, I never experienced that. Have you have you had such experience to re refinance on your car? 
Well, my question is um, refinancing it, like can you like start over for another five years, like whatever you paid off and then you start a new... You can do it, but uh, in reality, I just cannot see the point. Because the value of the car each year drop. Five years after, probably there's not too much value on your car. I don't see any bank would like to get a refinance on your five years old car. That, that is a problem. But it, it is totally different case on your, on your home. Because five years after, your home you usually value go up. So this is the reason why you can get refinance on home. A lot easier than refinance on your car. So this is why I say I, I don't have any experience, at least on myself to get a refinance on the car. Not much good example on that because the value drop almost every year. And five years after, probably not much value left on your car. That's my point. But if you're, for some reason, it's a collection car or something <laughs> else, right? Yeah, yeah. Collectible, maybe you get a refinance. Otherwise, I just don't see the point. Okay, quickly, okay, go back to here. The final year, you pay the same amount, but you adjust this so every year you pay this cash however you apply the different amount to the interest and also to the note payable so three years after you total pay out 500,000 note payable is all finish everything okay all right so yeah go ahead Okay. So if you, if you look at it together, if you actually have two dollars more than you need. Yeah. So they try to get close. You know, I would say in in real life they will do the adjustment to close out two hundred thousand even. They cannot they cannot leave something you know left over there. They must close out. You have to be do the adjustment. Say close enough. This is just for the you know, demonstration. Is it? But in real life, you need to close out. You need to match exactly number to the dollar, to the cents, <laughs> to the penny. All right, so that's so good, right? Okay, very quickly, we jump to the uh, ratio, okay? And I did not prepare the slide for the, uh, let me see. You need to uh, use your book, okay? Sorry about that, I, I, I only provide, uh, Take a look of the, uh, this is the Home Depot. Okay. We have, uh, we have uh, income statement on the page 708. We need to use this. And, uh, we have uh, Pages seven A, pages seven nine. You need to use two pages. So you have both. You can look at that. And also, we need to use the page seven nineteen. And there are around twenty five uh, seventeen here. Okay, this is here. To do the uh, financial analysis, the financial analysis. I believe you done this. Uh, and your finance class, right? Did you? Have you? I yes. believe so. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because this is a very good tool, okay, to evaluate the strength or the weakness of each company. Of course, there is a big assumption here. Every time I need to give you the head out, okay? I need to give you the head out, okay? Every time we get into the financial analysis, there is a big, big assumption here. Can anybody tell me what is the big assumption is? We need to assume the financial report itself are trustful. If the report is provided by Enron, and they really, they really mean nothing, right? They really mean nothing. So even you know, you know those reports certified, audited by the big, you know. CPA firm, 
But if, if there's a fraudulent end, we cannot do anything better. We cannot do anything. So there is a big, big okay, assumption is we must trust you know, those numbers, they are real one. And they are real one. But you know, in real life, that is not the case. Uh, each company, they can always, within the limit of the law, okay, they can always manipulate. They can always manipulate something somehow, you know, as long as you know this is within the limit. Anyway, okay, everybody, we need to, we need you to participate, okay? We need you to participate this uh, this this moment, okay? The number one, ROE, return on equity. So right now we know what equity is, right? We know we know where to find ROE, right? Okay. We know where to find the net income, right? We need to combine those two statements all together to find out this number. So I need a volunteer who can answer the number one. Oh, by the way, we use the number 2007. How about that? Because on the chart, it's from 2005 to 2007. We need to use Home Depot, okay? Do we have a volunteer to calculate what is a 2007 ROE for Home Depot. Anyone here? If no one here, I will, I will call upon okay. your choice. We have almost like a 40 minutes to finish everything. I think we, we, we should have a sufficient time. <coughs> but before we go to that, okay, let's talk about what is ROE. Number mean nothing, okay? Number really mean nothing. When you see this number, okay, it is kind of percentage, by the way, okay? Um, it is kind of percentage. So when you see ROE, what does it mean? When you see 10%, 20%, 5%, or negative, what does this number really mean to you? What does ROE mean? Let's talk about what's equity. Let's get a refresh. What equity is? Equity includes two parts, two portions. What are those two portions, equity? They include what? Contribute capital and retain earning. Retain earning. All right? So your contribute capital may be small. However, during the years, your company generate the profit from the operation, so you accumulate more and more return earning, right? So those two numbers, eventually this one number, by the way, okay? When, when we say average stock shareholder, it means year beginning and year end. So you divide it by two. Or if there is not too much change, you just use one number, it's okay. So, can anybody tell me what is the number of 2007? Um, it's already in the book. It's fine, but nobody, somebody, had, they don't have a book, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> we need to it's on page 718. Okay, 718. Yeah, okay, let's everybody go. Let's go over there. Okay? Uh, we have uh, go to the right page. Am I right? Is this a 2007? I hope I'm right, okay. Yeah, on your, on your page 709. Right, page 709. Let's everybody go over there, okay. 
number by itself is not really important, okay? Let's, let's see where can I find it, okay? Where can we find it, okay? So, assuming this is 2007, hope I'm right, okay? I could be wrong. Okay, so we have a stock shareholders equity, so the number should be here, right? Yeah. 25, and this is a B, by the way. Okay, 25, assuming this is a B, this is B, B class business, oh, by the way, okay? So, but we can just, just disregard it. So we have 25 here, okay, 25 here. Am I right, everybody? Okay, then go to file what is the net income for the year. It's page 708, right? 7, 7, 8, right? I found my page 708. 708. 708. So what number it is? 5,000. 5,000. 5,000. But this is not 5,000, it's 5B. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, this is 5B. We just say 5. Okay? Right? So I have a 5 here. So this is a numerator, a numerator here, five. Denominator, how much, how many? 21. What? What's the number? We just uh, saw it. Everybody, how much? 25, right? 25. 25. 25. Uh, 25. So five divided by 25, almost like that. 22.2%. So everybody got it? So far everybody got it? Right? So we have each $5 net income generated by total 25 equity. <coughs> Good enough, I would say. 20% something. By the way, everybody, when we say good or bad, we based on what? Based on what we say good or bad? Well, if I say, okay, I'm satisfied. And satisfied means we are running a business. And we all together will raise twenty-five dollars. So everybody was sitting here in this classroom, and we raise total twenty-five dollars here. Then we assign one or two people go out to run your business. You can just sell the hot dog, okay, off the street. I don't care, okay. And by the end of the year, we see five dollars net income, and we say this is good, and we say this is bad. Based on what? What make you satisfied? Or not satisfied? Market interest. Say for example, you if you deposit $25 in the bank, you got almost nothing. Probably negative because the bank charge your fee. <laughs> for today's market, right? We compare today's general economy market, right? So one way we say good because we compare to the very safe way to keep this $25. We just deposit it. But we know today we compare the $5 net to negative. Of course, $5 is much, much better, right? So this is one way we say, okay, 20% is good. What else? What make, make you not happy? Even $5 compared to the bank. You still say, oh, it's so bad. Why? Expectation. Based on what? You need to be more realistic. Say, for example, if I, we raise $25 here, same story, but instead of appointing to you, we appoint to Jackson, and he go out to, uh, really, he's running another business. Also, selling the same hot dog off the street. But he makes $7. So I would say, well, next year I would shoot, right? So we can compare the same industry, right? Home Depot versus, what's the other one? Lowe's. Lowe's, right? I don't know, they're, they're almost, almost the same, right? Almost the same, the same thing. Well, probably one is better than the other. So you can, you can compare among the same industry. But even Jackson running the same business, $5, you still, don't feel satisfied. Why? Same thing. We <laughs> collect twenty-five dollars, and each of you from the same business selling the, the hot dog on the street. Each one of you say the best thing we can make is five dollars. But you still say, "Oh, I'm not satisfied." Why? 
because you're compared to different industry. Right? So at least we have three comparison we can make. We can make it more complicated. We compare to the general economy. Oh, <coughs> satisfied. However, when we compare the same intra, okay, intra industry, maybe you feel good or not. So that's the second way you compare the same, okay, intra industry. And the third way you, you compare inter industry. Okay? Of course, after we compare industry, the four is we can compare different region, different country, different market. Assuming the global business is free, but which is not a battle. Okay? The global business comes with more complicated restrictions. So at least we compare general economy, we compare same industry, we compare different industries. That really means the opportunity cost. Okay, so all right, that's the first one. Uh, okay, go ahead. But why do you use average stock stockholders? Okay, okay, very good question. He said, why do we use average? Why? Anybody got an answer? Why do we use average? Assuming the same share. Assuming what? Let me go back to his questions. Why do we use average? And those two numbers are too much difference. If those two numbers close enough, we don't care about average. So, okay, let me answer your questions again. Why do we use average? Because they are two numbers, or they are 365 numbers. Because every day the number change. As long as those numbers stay close enough, variation, you, you study the stati statistics, so you know that, right? As long as the variation within the limit, we don't care. We only care about if the number vary too much, too many. At the beginning is one, by the end of the year is 100. That's the where the point we need to consider the average or more advanced statistics number. Otherwise, who cares? If every day is only one share difference, right? So the answer to you is why do we care about the average if the numbers vary too much? Otherwise, we don't care. Okay, let's go to the second one, ROA. ROA. So I think we can get you volunteer right now, right? Oh, by the way, close your book right now. Or don't look at your book right now. Without calculating anything, without doing any other research, which number should be bigger? ROA, ROE. Which number, which percentage should be higher? 